Hi, listeners. I'm Clem Lee, a former editorial fellow and a current guest editor at the New England Journal of Medicine. We are so delighted you have tuned into this podcast. Our amazing former fellow, Myrtle Nandamuni, who is currently an oncology hospitalist at the Yale Smilo Cancer Center, dives into the ins and outs of how pediatric board exams are created and vetted. It's an eye-opening listen, but before we get started, I also wanted to mention our ongoing podcast collaboration with CoreIM called Beyond Journal Club. Along with my co-hosts Greg and Treya and the current NHIM editorial fellows, we journey through the landscape of clinical trials in a specific topic area and make it fun, fresh, and relevant for your practice. These episodes can be found on Spotify or Apple Podcasts under the CoreIM feed or on the NEJM Resident 360 or CoreIM websites. We hope you'll check it out and welcome any feedback that you have. And without any further ado, I'll hand the mic over to Myrtle. Welcome back to this episode of Curbside Consults. Today, I'm speaking with Dr. Andrew Dwyer, a psychometrician and director of psychometrics at the American Board of Pediatrics, which creates and administers examinations to test pediatric knowledge in both general pediatrics and subspecialty fields. Dr. Dwyer obtained his PhD in psychometrics, a focus within the field of educational psychology. Welcome, Dr. Dwyer. Hey, nice to meet you. Andy, maybe we can start off and you can tell me how you got into psychometrics. What is a psychometrician and what do you do day to day? Uh, So great question. Not many people have heard of the field of psychometrics or know a psychometrician. So psychometrics is the field of mental measurements, or in another word, psychometricians are those who are experts in standardized testing or assessment. And so really psychometricians are interested in designing assessments that measure specific construct of interest. In my case, it's the knowledge needed for safe and effective practice in pediatrics, but also to make sure that the scores that come out of that assessment are used appropriately and fairly. So do you write questions for the pediatric board exam? Good question. No. So someone like me is an expert in how to do testing well, but usually psychometricians are not content experts in whatever field the assessment is being developed and administered in. So in my case, no, I'm not a pediatrician by training. So who writes these questions for the exam? It's a panel of practicing pediatricians in general pediatrics or in one of the pediatric subspecialties to write the test questions that end up on our exams. We train, in our case, pediatricians to write good test questions and to help us establish the score that's needed to pass our assessments. And how does the ABP decide what content to test? I mean, there's so much to cover in the field of pediatrics. How do you know which content areas to focus on? We rely on a process that we refer to as practice analysis. What that involves is sort of a two-phase process. The first phase is that we recruit a panel of practicing pediatricians. And I should mention that almost all the work we do relies on panels of practicing pediatricians. We ask them to identify the tasks that are critical to the role that people perform on the job. And then we ask them to identify the knowledge and skills that are necessary to safely and effectively perform those tasks. And once we have that list, we really have what we refer to as our content outline, the list of topic areas that are important for the practice of general pediatrics, for example, that we build the test to cover those topics. The second part of that process is that once we have that content outline, the draft content outline, the list of knowledge areas that are important for practice, we actually send that list out and we refer to it as our validation survey to everyone who is certified in that field general pediatrics or one of our pediatric subspecialties. And we send it out via online survey and collect feedback from the entire field on whether or not we missed anything important or whether or not something that we've listed is really not critical for practice. And it's that validation survey part of the process that really allows us to have some confidence that the panel hit the mark when they were identifying the knowledge areas to be included on the exam. And so we rely on that survey a great deal to help us determine whether or not the content we're assessing is appropriate or not. How do you decide if a particular test year is a fair test? If say the test this year has content that is different than five years ago? Yeah, that's a really good question. We're generating new items or new test questions on an ongoing basis every year, undergoing revision and updating and review. And we're constantly developing new questions to reflect new guidelines in practice. And so, There is a process that we follow to develop content. There's a series of reviews and revisions. And once a test question actually makes it onto an exam, then the full exam committee will review that exam in its entirety and make sure that every question is appropriate, fair, at the level that is appropriate, and and things like that. How long does it take to put an exam together for a given year, say for the general pediatrics exam? 
we have a pool of items, a bank of items that are drawn from. Once it's time to build a new version of the exam, we have some internal staff that will, what we say is build a form, uh, build a version of the exam that then is passed off to the exam committee, the panel of pediatricians, and they give it review and approve it a few months before it's administered. So it's about a six to nine month process from the time we start building a particular version of the exam until it's actually administered. Well, I've heard it told, and this might well be a rumor, but maybe you can dispel it if it is, that there are questions on each exam that are considered experimental and that don't count towards the final score and are a way for picking the temperature or setting a standard of some sort. Is that true? Do you have experimental questions hidden on the exam? No, in most cases, for most of our exams, all of the items count towards a person's final score. We do have a few exams where that is true, where we insert experimental items randomly into the exam, and those items do not count towards your score. The reason we don't do that for all of our exams, it's actually fairly common practice to have experimental items on an exam. We don't do it because we're trying to control the length of our exams. Already our exams are fairly long. For example, our general pediatric certification exam is 335 items administered over an eight hour period of time. And so if we were to insert questions that didn't count towards your score as a way to pretest items to make sure that they are in fact good items before they are used operationally, that would be all right, but it would increase the length of what is already a very long exam. And so, Our model is that we intend to use every item that is administered in the calculation of someone's final score. And after we administer the exam, we do some analyses to make sure that the items are appropriate, that they are accurate, that they are performing well before we compute final scores. Is that why it can take several months to get your scores back even after you've completed the exam? Exactly. We get this question a lot why does it take so long to get my scores back? And the truth is that we, administer the exam, but before we release scores and tell people how they performed, we're doing a large number of analyses to ensure the accuracy of the data that we get back from our testing vendor, Prometric, to ensure that the test questions are not too easy, that they're not too hard, that we're trying to determine whether or not the new version is easier or harder than any previous versions because we need to make adjustments, if so. And so there's just a large number of analyses that are all designed to ensure the accuracy of scores and to ensure that everyone's being treated the same consistently across, regardless of which version of the exam they receive. So how do you determine the standard passing score? So we call it the passing standard or the passing score. And how we determine that is we will recruit a panel of practicing pediatricians. Again, this is a diverse group. In the case of standard setting, we like to make sure that we have some program directors, some individuals who were recently certified, some more seasoned veterans on the panel, and we ask them to go through the exam and follow a very well-established process. And by the way, there's information on our website about all of this stuff that I'm talking about, if anyone's interested in learning more about how we do these things. We have a portal on our website where pediatricians who are interested in becoming item writers or serving on a standard setting panel or a practice analysis panel can submit their name and information. We will also send out a large email blast to the entire field of individuals who are certified in that discipline. But this panel will go through the exam and ultimately will make a determination, a recommendation for what they think is a fair passing score, the score that reflects the minimum level of knowledge needed for safe and effective practice. And once they've recommended a passing score, it's the board or we call them subboards in the pediatric subspecialties who reviews their recommendation and almost always approves their recommendation for use as the passing score for that particular version of the exam. I would love people to know how seriously we take the responsibility of certifying, in our case, pediatricians We really strive hard to make sure that our exams are current and relevant and up to date and that the scores reflect the true knowledge level of anyone who's seeking to become board certified in a particular discipline. Let's switch gears a little and talk about some of the other examinations that ABP administers. Let's focus on in-training exam. How does the ABP use the in-training exam to guide or shape in any way the general exam? The ABP doesn't use the results or the information we obtain through the in-training exams to inform or 
have an impact on the way we develop or administer the certification exam. Really, the whole purpose of the in-training exam is so that program directors can have some feedback, some formative feedback on whether or not their trainees, or their pediatric residents, or their pediatric fellows are making adequate progress through their training programs. So that's really the main reason we even develop those in-training exams is to give program directors an assessment that they can use to help track the progress of their trainees. But it's also true that we do provide some information in the reports after the in-training exams are administered. And we can say, okay, if you are a first-year trainee and you score in this range on the in-training exam, here is the likelihood that you go on to pass the certification exam once it's your time to take the certifying exam. So we do give some information about whether or not people are sort of on track to pass the certification exam, but that's not really the primary purpose. The primary purpose is to give program directors, A, are people making, are trainees making adequate progress? And B, if they're not, here are some domain level breakdowns of their score performance. So you can identify areas of strength and weakness and help that person sort of get back on track if they're not. That makes sense. A snapshot in time almost of where a person is as they progress through their training. Once you're done with training though, the uh, examining doesn't stop. So talk to me a little bit about MOCAPEDS. How is the program designed and how is it different from the initial certifying exam? Yeah, so MOCAPEDS is a relatively new program at the ABP. We piloted it in 2017 and 2018 and launched in 2019. And it represents sort of a major shift in how we view assessment in the context of maintaining certification or continuing certification. MOCAPEDS is really a blend of formative and summative assessment, an assessment for and of learning. And what I mean by that is that there are elements of MOCAPEDS that are really designed to be more of a learning tool than they are an assessment tool. There are elements that are designed to help people stay current, help people learn. And for example, the items themselves you're told immediately whether or not you got that question right or wrong, and you're given a rationale that explains why the right answer is right, why the wrong answers are incorrect, and given a list of references in case you want to go read more on the topic of that question. You <laughs> make it sound almost fun. <laughs> I got to say, it has been very well received in the community. Everyone loves Mocha Peds, especially when they uh, compare it to the proctored exam, which, you know, no one loved. So anyone who's scheduled to take our certification exams or any of our exams can go to our website and you can see, first of all, the content outline, which lists out all of the topic areas. That's usually a good first place to start for anyone who's looking to take our exams is figure out what content areas are going to be covered on the exam. Then second of all, there is a lot of information on our website that describes the processes we follow to develop the exams. And I think that once people see that we're trying to be transparent with how we're developing the exam and how the exams are scored, it sort of relieves any pressure associated with not knowing what's going to be on the exam or what kinds of things might show up that would be unexpected. And then the last thing I'll say is that we do offer sort of a wide variety of self-assessments on our website. They count towards part two credit if you're already certified. But they can be helpful ways to just practice the kinds of questions that show up on the certification exam. What mechanisms are in place at the board to ensure that test questions maintain a standard of equity, fairness, and mitigate bias? We have a couple mechanisms in place to help us ensure that the test questions are free of bias. The first and main mechanism we have in place that's been around for a long time is that we give our item writers rigorous training on how to avoid content that might be problematic. That could be biased. It could be problematic in a number of different ways. And so we rely heavily on our item writers and we train them to avoid problematic phrasing and content when they're developing questions. That being said, we recently incorporated a step in the process. Once the exam is administered, we perform an item analysis that looks to see if any items are performing differently across racial or ethnic or gender subgroups. And if we flag that item and we put it in front of our bias and sensitivity review panel, and these are pediatricians again, but they are experts in identifying problematic or biased content. And they look at those questions and they tell us whether or not 
there are any problems with the questions and we take their recommendation. If they say this is a problematic item and it needs to be removed from scoring, then that's what we end up doing. We just published a paper in pediatrics that describes that process in more detail if anyone's interested about it. Thank you so much, Andy. I think this was a very eye-opening look into the process of creating these board exams. Many of us have taken boards of one kind or another, but not often had the opportunity to hear about how those boards are made. So I really appreciate you taking the time to come down here and chat with us today. Thanks so much for having me. Well, that wraps up this episode of Curbside Consults. I'd like to thank Dr. Andrew Dwyer of the American Board of Pediatrics for joining us today to discuss the process of creating and administering pediatric board exams. We are always looking for ways to improve our podcast and educational materials, so if you have any comments or suggestions, please leave us a review on iTunes or email us at resident360 at nejm.org. We would also like to form a focus group to get more formal feedback, so if you're interested in participating, please email us at resident360 at nejm.org. Our production team includes Karen Buckley, Lynn Winston-Perry, Kyle Simmons, Mike Thomases, Tim Vining, Scott Williams, and Kathy Stern. Also, a special thanks to our NEJM education editor, Dr. O.P. Hamnick. Curbside Consults is brought to you by NEJM Resident 360, a product of the NEJM Group.